Interviews with my music heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome everybody inside the Blackwood Broadcasting Studios at an institute of higher learning that remains undisclosed. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. and We're happy to have all of you along with us today. To believe that you were part of a real movement towards social progress, to some, is validation. For those who were actively involved in cultivating the spirits of change is magical. When the involvement is through rhythm, then the spirit transcends. My guest today came from one of the greatest regional hotbeds of local music, the San Francisco Bay Area. He was the drummer for Sly Stone and the Family, which fashioned multi-ethnic, multi-racial, bi-gender members, intent on exposing the city by the bay as a place of experimentation, intellectualism, and a downright fuck you to American conformity. My guest moved on from the family and made stops along the way with Carlos Santana and played with some of the greatest Afro-Cuban percussionists, including Victor Pantoa, Willie Bobo, Armando Peraza, Coke Escovito, guys who were rooted in the rhythms made popular by Bay Area vibist Cal Jader. From Latin Rock to Weather Report and the Boogie Woogie Waltz with Joe Zawinul. While my guest dwelled in fusion, he was also tied into the Novato scene, the barn with Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzmann. Maybe Zakir Hussein would show up and play some tabla. Maybe he took a trip over to Lee Charlton's to play with the Gravity Adjusters expansion band with Richard Waters and Tom Donlinger. Ultimately, this paved the way for a connection with Jerry Garcia and John Kahn in this host's favorite pocket of that band's lifespan. I wish there was a riot going on. Gregorico, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. How you doing, Jake? It's good to talk to you, my friend. Good to be here. Uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, as I've gone through this, um, Chicago, Detroit, Philly, New York, Miami, Atlanta, uh, Southern California, every, every region, because we weren't interconnected, had their own regional scene. And to actually talk to a member of a band who was really... Basically, the catalyst for that is is quite remarkable, and I wonder, um, just in your mind, how amazing it was, like I said, to be a rhythm maker for that change. Well, it was, uh, it was you know, like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I, I've always loved rhythm. I've loved, I always loved drums as a little kid, <clears throat> although I didn't start playing until I was 14 years old. That was a matter of, uh, you know, family situation. I, I really didn't have any encouragement as a little guy to start. They didn't want the noise in the house. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> it was that simple, you know. And so, you know, you start getting a little bit independent. And so I, as you know, when I got of age, I had the same passion and I pursued it, you know, and followed it. And... um you know, I started playing when I was 14. That's when I got my drum set. I started practicing and, you know, what have you. And I was self-taught <clears throat> when I was 17 and a half, December of 1966, we started flying the family stone. Oh, I mean, it's just, and again, for me, uh, born in 78, uh, this is all a fantasy. But it, to me, it was the most vibrant and complex period of, of music in our history, um, I wonder, um, I wonder sometimes against, and when, when we talk about this statement, uh, Sly and the family stone and the, what were, tell for younger generations, for, for my audience, uh, what were the messages, not within the music per se, but what were, what were you trying, what were you f pushing back against? Well, you know, at that point in time, in history and and you know in social presence of the day <clears throat> what we did was very out of the box you know uh you know there wasn't at that at that time there wasn't bands that were um necessarily especially in the pop world and you know in the high profile picture um musical entities that had mixed race uh, you know, male and female i mean it was really it was a challenge and at that <clears throat> also at that time you know socially it was during the 
a time period of there was a lot of race upheaval. There was you know riots and stuff in cities, and there was a lot of stuff going on socially. So to boldly step out there and make that statement that hey, we're going to get together and and you know if it wasn't for music <laughs> being the element that it is, you know we wouldn't have been able to do it. Most likely, I don't think. I think that was really, that's really the catalyst. The music was the catalyst to you know do something uplifting and positive as as that. Yeah, you Especially know, during that period, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, and the, and the thing is that we had a draft, and that was huge for the Vietnam War. We don't have that today. So mm-hmm. you have a volunteer army, and where a lot of people don't even know anybody related uh, to the army. There's nothing personal. Whereas, but opposed to maybe you grew up in a ethnic Italian neighborhood, I'm not sure, but you know, you saw guys that weren't coming back home and as everybody did. And so that was a catalyst. And then on top of that, as I do more research, uh, it's this period of time, this cross, it's funny. I was talking to Mike Finnegan, the great organ player. And I, I I use Mm -hmm. the term cross fertilization. He's like, no, I've fertilized many things. I think he goes, it was cross, (laughs) it's cross pollinization, cross pollinization of music. Bob Jones, the drummer, uh-huh. Uh, talked about that. When you think about what was happening uh, in the Bay Area, I mean, the Bay Area is still cool. My my in, my engineer is going to go up there this summer, and that's the only place he wants to go see live music, and I don't blame him. But then to go back and mm-hmm. be like, what the heck? I mean, you could be getting an education at San Francisco State, then heading out to West Marin to play with Martin Fierro and John Kahn. I don't even know how you... I can't even contain myself with the fantasy, but, but yet you lived it. And that to me was people, we were just a lot less politically correct. And that wasn't a bad thing. Things, people were much more relaxed and much more comfortable. And I think you saw leaders as well. I mean, guys like Santana, Buddy Miles, I mean, it it was, where did that leadership, how did those people come to, to the forefront? Well, you know, the Bay area was always a, a very creative and different place so i mean this you know this was a nest that had been you know it had been sitting there for a long time waiting waiting for the right moment to hatch and that was the moment the late 60s early 70s that just everything that came out of here you know it's it's you you got a set of circumstances that exist at any point in time and and it was just you know it was the perfect storm you know it was politically, socially, you know, the the pull of of all the shortcomings that were going on, you know, it just in the world. It was it was a pretty every time there was some serious things going on, then you know, wars and social unrest of different kinds. It was just a lot of a lot of changes, <clears throat> and so music speaks to that. You know, we, as, you know, artists, uh, you know, are, are, are plugged into the um, you know what's going on in nature, or you should be in touch with that, and 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 and, and you your music reflects those things. So we, you know we were around at the right time, right place, and it's just like I said, it was a perfect storm. And and you know when we were doing that, we weren't I, I, we weren't really conscious of. You know later on, I come to appreciate what we did <clears throat> in a different way than when we did it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Then I was having a ball. I can't even imagine. No, but yeah. So talk, <laughs> talk about how you feel. That's so interesting. As as you've evolved and as your career has evolved, looking back on it, how do you? What's the appreciation that you have for that time? Well, you you come to understand it differently and just accept it as almost like as almost a fan in a way. I mean, there was a time, you know, we when we did what we did, then then as things evolve and you know it fell and. We went away, even the, you know, and you know, thirty years. I guess it's a testament to the songs and the music and what it really, what it actually was. It it it, it finds life again. It lives. It connects with people. You know, when we're generations down the road removed from when it was created. <clears throat> so that I've come to appreciate and learn and respect. You know, in a different way than we even. <clears throat> Even at the pinnacle and you know the height of our existence and our career as a band, you know, you didn't realize that then. I mean, it was just you know we we the music we knew was good. We were doing our thing, and you know we knew we were connecting and we're getting off on it. And but you don't realize the scope 
when you do something or when you're part of something that really <clears throat> that really touches humanity or touches people and changes things and really affects people and connects in a, on a certain level uh, on a high level you, you don't you don't really appreciate that uh, until it has its you know until it runs its course meaning it could even fall from grace and for whatever the different reasons <clears throat> and then it finds its way back to life again not through record industry marketing promotion you know or someone throwing money at it or whatever just on its own mm -hmm. everyone went their own way and you know we you know, I, I, I even had cut, I was out of music for a while. Where I mean, I was never out of music, but I always played, but I wasn't, like, active and pushing to do the next thing. You know, I had, had done a lot of stuff, so at some point in time, I just, you know, took off and, and raised a family and just slowed down. And then I find myself back into it again, and it's and it's really great because it's, just, it's, it's something that's in me, and <clears throat> along the way, I I see and I realize uh, in a different light and the scope of what we had created in that short period of time, those five, six years, you know, in the late 60s. Or yeah, like no, and I mean, to me, it's like, uh, I don't know exactly when you decided to take a break, but to come out of that with so many transcending moments on the stage live where there was just this incredible... Uh, and, and, and it's funny cause I talked to, um, this is a question I, I, I wasn't expecting to ask so early, but I, I, I talked to Paul Farso from the loading zone and he talked about sometimes going out at the film or maybe he'd be, the, he'd be opening for you or be opening for, for the dead or Jefferson airplane. Mm -hmm. And they might play like a 25 minute, you know, at that time, I, that's what I call fusion music. Really. That was just fusion, you know, it was yeah. just, and, and, and <clears throat> You know, jamming. right. And they would play a, they, oh, I'm sorry. So they play a set and, and again, I'm under the impression that the fans are locked in and they end their set and there's barely any applause like the, <laughs> and the drugs were, they, the like people were just out of it. And so then they took a break and they were really frustrated and they said, you know what, let's go back out there and hit it. They did a 25 minute instrumental jam right. and, and stunned them. And then when they ended it, boom, one guy in the back started clapping and then everybody clapped. But I, I right. mean, the, yeah. the, the, did you find with, with Sly and, and maybe with Santana as well early on, like we're were the fans locked in or were they or were they out of it i'm trying to get the idea of the passion there and whether the the drugs were sometimes overly consuming and and uh, and, and muddled them well we weren't <clears throat> at that time uh the jam quote jam band mm -hmm. was was you know was with was in its heyday you know like the dead did and the quicksilver and you know there's a lot of just you know, improvisation on stage, uh, not in the way of like uh, you would see a, a jazz uh, act or anything or a jazz artist, but just more experimentation <clears throat> um, in music. We had a we had a show. We had we had like a set that we did. We had a show. We had songs. You know, um, and and so we used to but i remember playing in front of audiences and just you know you'd start this song would end and, <laughs> and everyone would stand there look at each other and it's like you know as i remember doing the same songs uh, and yeah. you know there's a after you know you stop the song and just roar and just everyone's just into it and you know 10 feet off the ground you know absolutely uh and it's hard to you know i mean there's different things that enable you to do what you do <clears throat> and um you know there's it, it could be expectation you know after you become like you know for instance when you did a a prime time tv show back then you know a lot of people seen you you know there was only three networks back then That's there right. wasn't internet there wasn't computers there wasn't ga video games and on and on and on all the you know 500 700 channels and on tv it was you know, it, it, there was this focus. And so if you were doing something that had some kind of value that connected to people, all of a sudden you got these huge numbers that were aware of that, conscious of it, and you got that. So when you put people together and they're all focused on one point, 
there's an energy that develops. There's a, a, another consciousness which goes back and forth between the audience and you on stage. You know, and you're passing like you're passing this thing back and forth, and it it, it grows, and it could become wild. It could become like you know enormous and. So that thing where you were on stage and you connect and it's just the time everything, you know, just just is right and you're lifted off the ground. The audience is lifted off the ground. You know, so you, you go every, between experiencing that to, you know, back up to you're, you're in a, a club doing your songs and there's three people there. I you know, mean, the, yeah. you got to have the attitude, though, that, you know, when there's three people there, you're going to... You're going to bleed. You know, you're, you're going to give all you have because this is what you're doing. Right. You know? As Bill and we had that attitude. We we were conscious of, you know, and we were into it. But, you know, we've had both experiences and both extremes. From playing a handful of people and it's just like, you know, to, to half a million people. And it's just overwhelming experience. You know? Such an honor to be talking to Greg Rico. Uh, there's so much going on. Um you know, there are yoga studios on every corner in Tucson, every corner of the world now, uh, meditation places, places for new age spiritualism. Wasn't the music used as a social, as a, as a, a means to further consciousness? I'm talking 60s, 63 to 73. You know, you, you had the Ali Akbar Khan School of Music out there. You had... Uh, Mickey Hart's Ranch. You had the mm-hmm. Beatles, the Beatles coming in, popularizing meditation, transcendental meditation. Maybe you were even involved with that with uh, with Densmore and those guys. I don't even know, but no, it, okay. But it seems to me that during that time, the yoga studios were the Fillmore West. <laughs> they were the Matrix. They were. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. But was there a the idea that you could have a transcendent experience through music at that time? Oh, absolutely. That's that's what going to the Fillmore was all about. The experience, uh, going to Chet Helms, you know, places. It was it was that experience. And of course, you know, again, I got to say, it, it was a unique set of things that came together. You know, the San Francisco audience, the San Francisco attitude, and that open and you know, laid back. You know. It, 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 and so that thing, it, it must have had value because it was something that grew and it spread to other parts of the country and even the world, different countries, picked up on, you know, how do we create uh, a happening, a moment where you put these different elements together and and we, you know, we, we allow this thing to happen that everyone's looking for, this consciousness, this coming together, uh, you know, that's out of the box compared to what was going on at the time socially. You know, it was, you, you, you got people together, you know, if it was like some kind of a political thing or whatever, you know, no one else had the power to do that. Right. In, in music, we, we had the key, and we had the key to make this happen. And fortunately, back then, it was being used in a very positive way, I think, in a very humanly uplifting way. And, you know, you could see it over, probably over the years where it was misused, has been misused, too. You just nailed it. And, and we'll, yeah. p- we'll pivot out of this thing, but, the, but yeah. the, you just nailed it. You nailed it because it was, hum- it was humane. It, was, it yeah. was lifting up humanity. That is exactly w- what I've been trying to get at after 300 interviews. You nailed it. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, you know, um, one more question here. Aside yeah. from Bill Graham, who gets, and rightfully so, gets a lot of, gets so much credit for, you know, Sly and the Family Stone, Malo, Miles Davis, you know, just putting all that diversity. He gets all that credit for in the media, the cross-pollinating of music and educating the public. Talk to me, were there other unsung media heroes, Ralph, Ralph Gleason, I know, wrote about it, but were there other guys that, that you remember seeing that sort of have not gotten... The because uh, I mean it was about the journalists, it was about the promoters, you know. And I'm just curious. Well, the, he, but Bill Graham was the guy. Bill Graham had, had the vision. He felt that he seen it. He knew that uh, that hey, you know, who was the, no no one was putting Miles Davis with the Grateful Dead, or yeah. you know, I mean, uh, Buddy Guy with the Quicksilver, or, <laughs> and he, he brought that. He had not, so in doing so. 
he gave these, you know, these these guys that were indigenous blues creators that were, you know, just playing little clubs and making ten dollars a night. Put them in front of young, hip audiences and and put them in front of the world stage. Put a shine a light on them, and so here that that you know was was a catalyst also for turning these people on to put them in the international stage where you know like uh, artists from the UK Rolling Stones or the Beatles were were able to access this stuff and seen wow this moves me they, I mean they 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 used they injected the, the, that soul into their music mm-hmm. and and they made it public knowledge they weren't afraid to say this is where it's coming from people you know listen to this so I have to say, Bill Graham, singly, single-handedly, I think was was is responsible for doing that. Wow. Whether someone would have came along after, and 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 I don't know. It, no, no one had done it before. He was the first, and he did it in a large way. I really miss him. And boy, we could use him now. Oh, I think he, <laughs> he's rolling over. In, he's rolling over in his grave right now. But oh I, man, I mean, yeah, and he really did, you know. And so, yeah, then you have the journalists that were just, you know there to write about things that were, you know, interesting, of interest, and things that were moving people and people were talking about, and, you know, they, they were part of it. But Bill Graham was the mechanic. He he seen the potential, he felt it, and he found a way to make it happen. And he worked on, he you know, consciously, you know, would involve himself in just in, in to projects and things to make to make it happen. And it wasn't always easy. You know, no, I mean, if I was a journalist that back then and I was interviewing Gregory Rico, I, my thing would be as an artist, uh, how enjoyable it must have been to to see, uh, you know, um, you know, Tony Williams and to see Victor Pantoa and to see, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Ringo Starr, whatever. I mean, you could borrow and you could look at what they were doing and say, well, I'm going to. I'm going to fuse that into what, I mean, there were so many flavors and it was everywhere. I mean, it was in the national. Well, you was influenced by what you, what you were experiencing, you know, and right. so everybody borrowed from each other and was, you know, you're influenced by it. And it was very uplifting. It was a very open, great time where you, where you had all this, these different things coming together only in San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, I get it. I, it may, may not have happened anywhere else. You yeah. know, I don't know. The fact is that it did. And I, I and being born and raised in San Francisco, I understand how it was different. I remember being in San Francisco when no one was looking except for it was that beautiful city to go visit, you know. But musically, you know, everything came out of New York, L.A., or, you know. So it was a time of a lot of change and a lot of development and experimenting and putting things together and making new elements, you know, one and one is three. Or one and one is eleven. Right. Yeah. Well, it was, it was it was it was about uplifting humanity too. I mean, that, yes. that, to me, that th- there is such a cynicism pervading our society because of the interconnection. Like you said, we're so interconnected, mm-hmm. um, and there's so much cynicism, cynicism that uh, this just seemed to be, uh, you know, whatever. We're 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 ruminating here. I'd like I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to, to to play a piece of music for you. Um, I found found the Quadraphonic LP this morning on it, so. Uh, We'll come back oh, wow. and we'll, uh, we'll we'll hit it, okay? Quad. All right.
So that was uh, January 0, January 0, 1972, New yeah. Year's, you know, and I... Not, Diamond Head Crater. Diamond Head Crater, yeah. uh, and I don't, I, maybe the Faith Interlude, I'm not sure exactly what tune, it was It was a wild, wild uh, ensemble here, just to read off uh, this maniac on fretless bass, Ron Johnson. <laughs> oh, he was wild. Dude, yeah. and that dude played on Bill Cosby's Bad Foot Brown and the Bunions uh, yeah. uh, albums, uh, and uh, he was a maniac, and then... Looking here, aside from, of course, Santana, Buddy Miles, I mean, one of the guys that I just uh, really wanted to ask you about is, uh, I know he struggled with substance abuse, but he was one of the greatest, uh, one of the most really beautiful cats, uh, was Hadley Callman. Oh, yeah. And I was hoping you could spend a few minutes talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, just the opportunity to collaborate with a guy like that, you know, because that's really, to me... He was p- part of that. What we're talking about, that magic of the Bay Area, he was part of that. Well, and within that statement, magic of the Bay Area, there was this little jazz club on Broadway Street in San Francisco that we all used to go and jam at. A lot of the guys from Santana. Uh, and then that's where I m- met Hadley. Uh, Luis, Luis Gasca, I think, the trumpet player. What was the name of the club? It was called Andres. Andre. Yeah. Okay. So continue. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 we. I mean, you'd come in some night. I remember, um, you know, just everybody would go there. It was. It, it got to be pretty. You know, we we did after hours there and everything. And and uh, when you know when we got off from the road or anybody down the road, you'd kind of this is where you would go and jam. And so it, some nights we had some pretty interesting events on stage you know? can you can you talk i would love to see this is i mean like you talking about like you had some conga drums some timbales some is yeah, that... victor that's where i met victor oh, Pensoia, you oh. know carabella would come down neil sham would come in and play or carlos would come in i mean it could have been anybody or or it would be 12 15 people on stage sometimes <laughs> you know? yeah it was it, it was just you know hang out we you know all drink and everything and carry on and um but there were some interesting nights of music there, you know, and, very interesting nights of music. But uh, I mean, the when, point is that you were able to essentially go, uh, you know, and and tr- and go on the road, and then uh, and then and play, you know, pretty standard sets, you know, whether it was a Sly or, or Santana, and then mm-hmm. uh, and then come back and play totally different. Well, maybe not totally different types of music, but but just stuff that would expand your ears, expand your your ability to listen. And well, it was... yeah, it was different, and there was there were you know it was consciously, you know you 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 wanted to do that, you know when you're touring a lot and you're doing your you know your thing, and it's it's really uh, you 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 know you look for opportunities to go and just experiment where you just throw stuff together, and and that was the attitude, and that was the you know that was the spirit of San Francisco back then too. It was really, it just was a hotbed for just that spirit. You know that free, experimenting, throwing different elements together, coming up with something new. That's why San Francisco, you know, at, at that point in time came out with so, just so died with diverse kinds of music. You know, I mean, look at all the different things that came out of here. You know, it's it's why, well, and I've done. I mean, everything from the Denny Zeitlin trio to the Jerry Hahn Brotherhood to the great, you know, to the Grateful Dead and the yeah, and the and the and they all shoot. Just you know, my question here is up up till this point, uh, prior to the early '70s, Santana, you had you know Mongo and Willie Bobo. Uh, they uh-huh. they would play with Cal Jader. You know, mm-hmm. nice yeah. Afro Cuban jazz settings. You know, very very nice danceable. I, I mean, it's beautiful. Red red vinyl you could get at the store, you know. And, mm-hmm. and Santana, he really revolutionized what percussion could sound like in a Latin rock setting. And 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 I'm just thinking that with Pantoa and and you know whether Bobo, you know Praza, Carabello, how long did it take for you guys to to mesh? Uh, as you was the drummer when you were dealing with multiple uh, percussionists. Well, you know, we knew each other from the neighborhood. You know, so I mean, we you know, San Francisco's small; it's only ten square miles. So, 
you know, it's, it's a big city, but it's a small town in some senses. <laughs> right. But, yeah. we, you know, so we all knew each other. We went to, you know, same neighborhood schools and all that kind of stuff, grew up together. So when the music thing was happening, you know, we'd hear, hey, did you hear so-and-so is with uh, doing doing this new thing? Or you hear, you know, and, you know, in my circle, or friends, where I had a lot of musicians, friends, and everybody was getting into and doing something, you know. I had first met Carlos, a friend of mine, uh, in the high school I went to, which was out in Daly City. He he actually lived in the Mission District in the center of San Francisco, and for some reason he was going to this Daly City school. So he was this guy was a drummer, and he goes he guy that introduced me to Carlos. You know, Santana's way before Santana. Mm-hmm. Santana blues band. I mean, just before. Right. We actually went over the house and we were kind of hit it off, and we ended up playing at this pizza place a couple times <laughs> in the Mission <laughs> District. You know, you know, and and uh, it, I love it. it was like a two or three piece. You know, right. And this right. was before you know it was fly. It was before you know when we were just were. I was playing in nightclubs with you know in beer joints. I, mean, I was 15 years old. Yeah. Th- this is what this is. So there was more flexibility within the scene. I mean, you had peanut galleries where you could go if you were underage and and and, and they'd court them maybe at the both end or something. You could go see guys like Dizzy or Miles Absolutely. if you were younger. But yeah. then also like yeah, I mean, you had pizza places or Italian restaurants that, especially when the Afro when the when the drums those 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 authentic African drums were coming in, you'd have like bongos or conga drums, uh, you know, in like pizza restaurants with like a trio, you know, and that snapping rhythm. I don't know. The tastes were just very sound back then. I, I the 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 onus on rhythm was so prevalent. There was no drum track, drum click, drum machine b- right. crap. It was yo. Let's put some let's put some calloused hands to mm-hmm. those to those to those drums and let's pound away. I mean the that's what Mickey Hart was about. I mean, I mean that was uh, that right. album, right? I mean that it, it's unbelievable. It was very rudimental. I mean, you know, because Carlos had a blues band. They had a, started a blues band. So you, you had, you know, blues mixed with rock, where the heaviness was, mixed with Latin, Afro-Cuban rhythms. So it was, this, again, we were, we were in a place that was just being born of all this, you know, anything goes. Yeah, forget the rules. Though you you can you couldn't mix this with that, and you know jazz guys wouldn't hang out with rock guys, and exactly you know, that, that though there was no separation. Were all the me were all these genres, and in be in San Francisco is an international city. It's a you know melting pot, you know. So you had all this diversity. Was already you know people lived here from all over the world. You know, it's not like if you went to you know. And we're in Nevada or Ohio, where it's just the same. You know, you, everything looks the same for miles and miles. All the same kind of people. You know, we had diversity here. It's, it's, it's a melting pot. And there's diversity planet. even more now. But my question for you is: you'd go into a, a Puerto Rican neighborhood or a Cuban neighborhood, or mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe Italian Af- uh, African American neighborhood, and I'm I'm guessing that at that time the drums were being used in those neighborhoods. I mean, everybody had their drums. Is that is that true? Well, you know, <laughs> it just happens to be that, you know, I, you know, show up at a point in time where that was all changing. Mm. Because to tell you the truth, whether it be making records or even uh, in a live situation, although, like, I was very influenced, like, say, with Buddy Rich. Sure. Big band jazz, you know, but he was he was the unusual in the jazz world. You know, when you're making records um, it, it back then, drums were really kind of like a uh, it was just a, a, an accompanied accompaniment instrument. It was just it was background, you know. And we were actually part of breaking that mold where the drums were put into the front, into the forefront, and the song and the music was built around that rhythm, the sound, the texture, the feel, was mm-hmm. a predominant part of the offering. And uh, both live and, and, and on record. And I think uh, our records were really, some of the first were that, you know, would change that mold of drums being a background instrument, whether it be in the pop world, R&B, you know, uh, blues, 
even even in the jazz world where most you know the traditional jazz groups were trios or quartets you know like Dave Brubeck you know Morello which I have is one of the records I used to practice to. <laughs> Take five. No, you but, know, you know. It's, it's so interesting because the time period, you know, you're talking about using the drums as more of a melodic instrument, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, it's just, it's incredible because, you know, whereas before you had just, it was about keeping time, and mm -hmm. now, then all of a sudden you look at, like, Bobby Hutcherson. What was he doing in 71, 72? I mean, he had Joe Chambers playing yeah. it, it sounded like It sounded like he had nine hands. Yeah. He, I mean, it, it was, and he was, he was just playing with sticks, but it's like, I mean, it was pulsating, but it also spoke to the history, and the what I'm getting at is this idea that what is sorely lacking in my mind today, and you might see it more than I do, but it's the idea that minorities, whether it's the Latinos or whether it's the it's the African Americans, the the idea that they don't they don't have those drums. I talked to Ray Mantia, a great percussionist, and you know from uh, from uh, he was born in uh, the Bronx, mm -hmm. and he said that. Three out of when he was coming up in the 60s, you know, uh, there in the fifth, late 50s and 60s, uh, Tito Puente, the Palladium was huge, and all these cat, all the younger guys, everyone had conga drums. And he yeah. said, he said it's down to like a th it's down to like you know, from 75 percent down to like below 30 percent now. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like if you don't know where your where your heritage, musical heritage is from, that's part of the where the humanity is suffering. I just feel like you can't. Tell me that Hadley Kalaman or Willie Bobo or, uh, you know, Victor Pantoa, those guys, they may not have been intellectual geniuses, but they knew where their roots and their, where their rhythms came from. And it added, Absolutely. same, with, same with, with, with Santana or anybody else. They, they knew their heritage. And I don't, as diverse as we are now, I don't know if the people, if musicians know well, that. I don't know. Well, well, like Santana, for example, you know, Carabello, like we used to hang out. I mean, like I said, we grew up in the same neighborhoods and stuff. And, you know, he used to, he would, hey, man, check this out. He had this, this record he got from Cuba, you know, <laughs> it was an import, it was probably smuggled in or something. He'd be listening to this stuff that was, you know, spiritual oh. rhythms. And he would he would listen to the fundamentals and the rudiments of that stuff and, and actually incorporate it in what they were doing in a lot of, their next single, you know, or the next song that they did, or, or in their music, just period. He's conscious of that, and he brought that to the table. So, yeah, there's an example of, you know, being conscious and be, being aware of those fundamentals and where it all came from and those things that really speak uh, to you and, and incorporating them in, into your music. And, you know, it shows. Look at look at the energy and the rhythms that they used to produce, uh, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say uh, the the other thing that one of my theses here, and you're you're a prime example of that, is um, this idea of uh, street learning versus academia. Whereas now you can, you know, I mean, the Ali Khan School was, I mean, you could go there and get degrees. I mean, I you mm -hmm. know, guys like Pete Magadini went there, yeah. you know, and people like that, you know, and yeah. and you can get, you could you can become intellectual, you can become a, a learned person, but uh, you didn't need. Uh, you could just go and hang with guys, uh, Carabello or, you know, mm -hmm. these guys, and you could, and through the street, through those, through those jam sessions at Andre's, you could learn more than you could in four years. At, and I think that that's part of, you know, w there's an imbalance because of, yeah. the, of the lack of venues now as well, you know? Well, you know, if you grew up in New York or at that time or, or San Francisco, you know, like I said, those were, these are international cities with melting pots so you had people from all over the world and so you you could access this this uh indigenous musics and rhythms and whatever you use you know you went out and looked for it you could find it you know so we were lucky i guess to be in in, in those places at those times you know i i used to listen to you know church uh, gospel music uh that's a you know i mean to big band with buddy rich uh, to Odd time signatures with Joe Morello, you know, take five uh, to Xavier Cougar to, uh, you know, I, I, I was exposed to all of it, and I really I lo loved good music, and it didn't wasn't necessarily in any one genre. I loved it. it was good music, and it spoke to me. I, you know, I'd get something from it, you know. Exactly. And then you incorporate that into what you do in the future and what you develop, and you know, it's all part of your spirit and soul, you know. 
you um you you uh when did you uh i don't want to ask this so uh simply but i assume that uh talk could you talk a little bit about you know going to mickey hart's novato ranch and uh and maybe uh, collaborating uh with the musicians you know sort of what we talked about where you know things would just spring up you know the concerts might be there and maybe k san would would broadcast it i don't know you know go ahead i miss hanging out we used to have so much fun hanging out at the ranch i I, you know at at one point in time i was living in la for a while and i just looked so forward to coming up and spending four or five days at, at mickey's on the ranch and whether we were doing you know i had involved him in some projects i was producing over time and so whether it was something like that or just going to hang out for the weekend or he'd be having a barbecue and everybody would be stopping by and right. jams and you know he was always way deep it was really it was quite a place uh that ranch i have a lot of fond memories from there you know whether it be outdoors or inside of the barn and you know just jamming and we spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time up there. Yeah, he. I mean, when I when I interviewed Zakir, he said Zakir said that that there was a period of time where they decided maybe over a period uh, a stretch of a week, let's just play music continuously for as long as we can, and and so and so he said I think they played for possibly three and a half or four straight days. Where, well, you know, um, and he used to do stuff like that, and yeah, at the ranch, and also. Uh, a project that we were all involved in was uh, Francis Coppola's, you know, Apocalypse. Apocalypse yes, Now yes. we did the soundtrack, and that's actually what we did for the soundtrack. Was um, it, it went on? You know, we we set up the, the the studio at the Grateful Dead studio. It was just there was monitors everywhere you looked. There was percussion every foot that you, every step that you took, you look down, there was something there to grab or beat on or whatever. It just would just set the scene and then flip the switch and go. And it went for about four or five days. And that's exactly what we did. That's how we came up with all that, that, that soundtrack. Where did that get yeah. recorded? Was that in LA or was that up in No, San- no, no. It was up here at the, at the dead studio. It was at the dead studio. Cause I remember I oh. reading a story about Coppola. In San Rafael, the one in San Rafael, no, not Novato. This was before they had the Novato. Oh, really? Story. Okay, so San Rafael and and, yeah. and 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 Coppola. I remember reading a story where he was like passed out on the couch. You know, like just That's like. Right. <laughs> yeah. I remember him showing up one. You know, in the middle of all this, he. Uh, it, you know, he's got his winery now. He's always been into wine. He had brought this big. Uh, what do you call the big uh, bottles of wine? Um, uh, it's a name for the. You should know that you're Italian. Yeah, I know. I can't. Remember. I'm blank right now. You know the big, the huge. Uh-huh. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and yeah. we were just kind of like opened it up and celebrating. You know, it was going along really nice. He was really happy with it, and uh, yeah, it was great. And that was one of those week long sessions. <laughs> just go continuous. And just when everyone was tired, you just found a little pillow or something. You just lay down, and slept, and. You know, you woke up and you hit it again. It would just went just went on for four or five days. Well, who would have known that uh, two days back to back in March of '83 would have such a massive impact on Jake Feinberg uh, and Gregorico, for that matter? Literally two straight days in March. We're going to take a listen to uh, uh, one piece of music, and we'll and we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. Oh, time for an old cactus tune. Yep. Something called Brother Bill. Key of G, guys.
You want to take a guess at what that is? You know, who's singing? <laughs> I, you know, I, the music, I, I, I think I could guess the music, but I can't recognize the voice. You want to take a guess? I mean, you, you want yeah, to... I, I, it's, it could have been, that might have been Lee Oscar playing harmonica, and it, might, it could have been uh, the, the Winterland live recordings with the dead maybe uh well i mean winterland was far closed by 83 no that oh, was well, yeah i don't know what no that, that was that was a treat that was pulled i pulled that you know this is why it's just magical to, to go through this because years ago you know when i started my getting really into music i was really into um you know downloading live shows or right. getting live shows and, and this this is billed march 10th 1983 um, and it's billed as Bob Weir and Friends from the Perkins Palace. Greg Rico on drums, uh, Weir, Bobby Cochran, Dave Garland on keyboards, and then I'm not sure, oh. not sure who's playing harp. But uh, but oh, then I, that would have been yeah in, well, that would have been what's his name Matt Matt Kelly. Well, I don't know if Matt Kelly's on this gig. What's his name? Wait, was it Gra Matt Kelly? Gra Graham Smith. And, and then I want to tell you who's singing though, yeah, because this is gonna you're gonna love this. Tim Bogert. That was Tim. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Well, that had to be because we had a trio: Tim, myself, and Bobby Cochran. No. And I remember we did a couple things with with Weir, and so geez, I never heard that. You know, since we did it, yeah, you know, I'll tell you, you get that from. <laughs> I'll mail it to you, man. It's 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 uh, it's it's just one of those things that somebody was somebody. Was sitting around Southern mm -hmm. California with their, you know, it was a broadcast on radio, and they they threw an analog tape in, and there you go. So I mean, wow. and it's and and I'll tell you, it's it's really funny because the banter on the stage is just hysterical. They're like, we've been together thirty seven hours, like and, you know, literally it was like <laughs> just you guys were all just sort of put together, you know, and and then and and it shows the the alacrity being able to just step in and. And play, and make that music swing. And those guys were really good. Uh, you got what? What was the name of this trio with Cochran? We we had a we had a band called the Trio, and it was <laughs> Bogart, myself, and, and Bobby Cochran. And so we had we had done a couple things with see, Jimmy Witherspoon, which was a fact, man. I I, rem, I don't know where the recordings at now, but there was this thing we did in L.A. Actually, was for the police department. This big barbecue, and of course, just off the hook. And yeah. I think Lee had came and set set into Lee Oscar, and and it was really cool. And then we did something with Weir a couple times, and it was just you know, this, yeah, it was called the trio, the, the three piece, you know. But we could have injected it with. We did things with you know, like like there with Weir, and I'm surprised I didn't recognize. I mean, I was going, I know that voice. I could not place it. Well, if you, if you had bet me a thousand dollars. I wouldn't have said Tim. <laughs> I couldn't place it, but yeah, it's Tim. Well, yeah. you're, the, we're, we're we're getting you a copy of that right away. <laughs> now, you know, I, and I'll tell you. So then, I, I'm looking at this last night. I'm like, oh my gosh! The next day, settle in, Greg, uh, and and listen to what we're about to hear. You know, and we'll come back and we'll talk. You got to tell me also where you got that quad record. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get That's to a it. Rarity. Yeah, we'll get to it all. Just settle in for this one because we're gonna. Yeah. This is for a little while. We'll come back and talk okay. about. It. All right. All right.
Just pure fire. <laughs> Three ticks in, and you know that's Garcia. <laughs> Boy, you know, I, you know that's kind of like I, they're, 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 I'm listening to that. I feel like it's, it's like strapping into a hand glider and just <laughs> man, man, I mean, you know. <laughs> well, what I wanted, to, I mean, for those fanatics, that that song was was a "Don't Let Go," which was a long form song, yeah. but I mean. You want to? I, I just, I, I serious. I was, I was, I've been home with my, uh, with my one year old, and I, I couldn't stop listening to that, fi- that five minute passage, for so long because it's like you think it's going to come to a lull, and then it starts spiking up again, and yeah, it then just, it, it like just, it's like flowing in the wind, and just go, go where, it, where it blows, and it just, you're in the jet stream, man. You know, <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting with with what Greg, year was that? Okay, so that so again, we're talking. We Bogert, Cochran, and Weir at Perkins Palace, three ten eighty three. The next day, Arico travels up to the Arlington Theater in Santa Barbara for the for the Garcia Band. I mean, what? And and then two days later, Jake Feinberg turned five years old. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, you know, the thing is, you 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 knew the dead going back a ways, but you happened to settle into the to the Garcia Band. Uh, during my favorite period, uh, most people don't feel that way, but, but I love 
82, 83, uh, you know, they were reconfiguring the band. Melvin Seals was in the band. And I wanted you to talk about, you know, in all honesty, your experience. I mean, you were there from, you know, you, you played in 75, you played a couple of gigs, really amazing gigs in 80 at, during uh, the summer. And then uh, 82 and 83, uh, oh, I was in and out of the band from between the time period 1974 to 1984. In and out, exactly. So yeah. when when you but when you were like in from 82 October 82 through uh, July of 83, you were mm-hmm. you were the drummer uh, for the Garcia band, and I wanted you to talk about. Uh, you played some. Inc- I don't know if you probably can't remember, remember back that far, but of course. I mean, I'm looking at these venues, the Chance in Poughkeepsie, and you guys went to East St. Louis, Illinois. I mean, you yeah. guys are going into black neighborhoods to play. Yeah, well, it was a big play. I mean, when it first started, you know, the whole idea was Jerry with Jerry was when he got back home from the dead. He wanted to go into a, an intimate venue and just play, you know, and do his, his Garcia thing, his Garcia band. You know, but it, so that's where it started, like, you know, the stone and, you know, so on. And it, he ended up doing what he didn't want to do, play big, huge venues for, you know, 25,000 people. Exactly. And, and, you know, what I, I mean, that's that's part of the issue, too, is that that idea of, of, of being able to put somebody like a Santana or in a pizza parlor or Garcia at a roller skating rink with those, with just regular humans, you know, getting yeah. off on that. It's just, it, you know, compared to a rock palace, it's just, and that was what the, the Arlington theater was like. And, and there you guys are going on a 16 minute jam. I don't even know. I mean, I would have had to leave the building, you know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> well, he, he would, I mean, that was part of the, why people would, would go see, cause he always took the liberty to do, it did that free feeling. That's why you listen to that. And, you, you know, to me, uh, beside just, you know, you know, being a part of it and that experience, but just stepping outside, it feels like you're, you know, you strapped to a hand glider and you're up there and in, in caught in one of the wind <laughs> cycle, you know, and it's grooving. You know? I just listened to your playing and, and, and there's like some, First, there's this really cool like reggae groove, and then and then all of a sudden, you know, you sort of get into this up tempo waltz j- marching kind of situation. It's just like, how do you? It was I know that you've been in it, were in and out of the band for many years, but when you really like eventually uh, in in October '82, did Garcia did Khan come to you and say, you know, we need we want you to be our drummer for the? How did that work? How did you get in full time? Well, that? I mean, it was it was kind of like that. Uh, from the beginning, uh, you know, I remember when he uh, first he first called me and asked me to come and play. Uh, the thing was, during that time period, I had I was producing several records, so I had a lot of production commitments. So I, if I remember correctly, I assume uh, the in and out part of being in the band was just because, well, I couldn't do that tour, or I couldn't do that tour, and you know. Uh, or they'd call and oh yeah I'm I'm free for the next six months I could do that you know and it was just that was my half of the experience if there was something else going on I don't know about it you you, you uh, if you I know you went on one very lengthy East Coast tour how would you guys would you guys travel separately or would you all go on a bus together how would that work well we all we you know we'd fly out to and then do a series of gigs and then that would be in the bus. You know, we'd fly, you know, to the East Coast or whatever, and then we'd we'd bus link, you know, um, custom motor coach, you know, to to all the shows that were on the East Coast or wherever, you know. And were you listening to? Would would you guys be listening to different types of music on the bus, or were you just, or was it just sort of like you'd be in your yeah. own portals? Yeah, it was it, well both. You know, I mean, you know, when you're on the road. You know, in, in a band, I mean, uh, and we're all in the same, you know, we're all in the same bus. And so it, you, you have all the regular experiences you would have with any group of people being together. You know, sometimes you're all kind of like together, list, you know, hey, listen to this, or listen to this, or maybe you're playing cards, or or maybe you're always tired, and you're just in their bunk sleeping, you know, and you don't talk to anyone for 10 hours, you know, <laughs> I, I, all the above. You, uh, one of the, I don't know if you caught the intro of my show, but aside from Sunship and Dizzy and Woody Shaw, uh, yeah. J- John Kahn made the cut for being one of the spirits 
on my journey. And I just wanted to know, uh, you know, about your, not just your collaborative mu- music, uh, musical experiences, but, you know, if you guys were personally, uh, if you, if you hit it off at all. Well, uh, John and I, uh, you know, it was more of just the, the, the friendship in the, the, you know, cooperation was just in, in the music. We didn't hang out, um, uh, separately, like you know, there were some people that we were, you know, we'd go and hang out just socially, go and go to the show, go have something to eat, whatever, go to over to someone's house and hang out. John and I uh, didn't have that kind of a relationship, but uh, it was pretty, you know, it was smooth on on stage and in regards to the music and everything, you know, we got along good and. It was fine, you know. Yeah, it, was a, it was a wind glider, is what it was. I so. mean, I met John through the Garcia band, and, and it, it basically didn't develop into anything else outside of that, you know. And and uh, at this, you know, we there's just so much we didn't get to. Uh, I, I I actually had no idea that until I did some research that that you were in that you were in weather report were you actually did you guys uh, did you make an album with them too i couldn't find any I, I did not unfortunately make a record however i was in 1974 um dougie rouch who was the bass player in santana at that time he was staying with me at my house and he brought this guy that he knew he said i'm gonna bring this guy down we used to jam all the time you know at the house and mm-hmm. he said this this bass player uh, his name is Miroslav Vitos, and he brought Miroslav down, who was the bass player with Joe and Wayne and Daum at the time, the weather report. And so he had brought it, but the second time he came down, you know, we were jamming and stuff, and he goes, hey, you know, Joe's looking for uh, a new drummer, and he, so he asked me to go out on this next tour that was coming up. And uh, I, I accepted it, and I had heard about the weather report, but I wasn't really familiar with the music. Right. It ended up being one of the premier experiences of my musical career. Hmm. The, wow. Not only people, but the music and just the whole experience. We went, we traveled Japan, Europe, and toured the States. I went around the world with them. And I got to say, it was, it was like going to college for me. It was really great. And this was after Sly. And, you know, I had to take, <clears throat> when I left Sly, I took about a year off. And didn't do it. I, I passed and turned down more things than I like to admit, probably. And then when I got back into it and started touring, I felt like going back out again. <clears throat> this was really an up, uplifting thing, and I found it to be just, you know, I mean, you know, fortunately, you know, God gave me the ability to be diverse in my in my understanding of music and my playing and all that, and it gave me the opportunity to do these different things and. That was really a very special one. I got to say. Well, I got to tell you, it's it's, and I'm glad because you you grew up in one of those first generation Italian households where they they just wanted you to keep the, the noise down, and thank God that you, <laughs> yeah. thank God you you know you picked up those you started banging around at 14 because I'll tell you it's you know it's one of the it's one of the uh, most prolific careers in one of the greatest regional hotbeds of music activity. Of all time, and and uh, so thank you, Ozzy Allers, for putting me in touch with Gregorico and Gregorico. Yeah, Ozzy, yeah. You know, I, I wanted to. Uh, we we have more to do, maybe a part two on the way, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time today to to let me go through my fantasies. Well, it's my pleasure, Jake, and and, and thanks for bringing me back to some of these experiences that you know just. Were lost in my mind way back there and it was i enjoyed it myself well, we're gonna mail out i'm gonna mail out that uh, bogart thing to you and the, and the quadraphonic as well we'll be in touch fantastic all right brother take it easy you too all right Bye-bye. now Bye. So the jake feinberg show we'll see you all in a little bit